In this video, we'll be adding a new example program to the Spectra Element Library in In the process, I'll share with you how we resolved the rather embarrassing bug and try to convey what many developers go through in the debugging process. The example we're adding uses our linear shallow water model. We've made modifications to add a Coriolis force, where the Coriolis parameter can vary as a function of latitude. This is what's called the beta plane approximation. This example is a resurrection of a test case Siddhartha Bishu and I developed a few years ago in a study where we proposed a suite of test cases for validating ocean models. Essentially, we initialized the model in a closed domain with a high-pressure monopole in geostrophic balance. Due to the variation of Coriolis parameter with latitude, a Rossby wave propagates, with long length scales moving west and a smaller scale opposing low pressure developing to the east. More on this in an upcoming video. We set up the domain to be a 1,000 km square and use a Gaussian function to initialize the high pressure. The velocity fields are diagnosed using geostrophy. We set the acceleration of gravity and mean ocean depth to be values typical of the North Atlantic and planet Earth, to an order of magnitude. The size and configuration of the grid match what we had done a few years back. We use 10 by 10 elements of width 100 km and Lagrange interpolating polynomials of degree 7 through Legendre Gauss points. Okay, let's run the simulation. What the fuck? That's not right. So wait, is it CFL? Our gravity wave speed is 100 meters per second, with an element width of 10 to the 5 meters divided by n squared that gives me 2 kilometers for my actual resolvable grid scale. If I divide that length scale by the speed of my gravity waves, it gives me a time scale roughly of 20 seconds. But hang on, I'm actually stepping forward at 0.5 seconds. There's no way this is CFL. Plus, the solution is not really blowing up. I know, let's check this on another piece of hardware. We'll run this on NVIDIA's V100s. What the fuck? It's right? Now we've truly entered Dante's fifth circle of hell. Now this is really weird. It doesn't work on AMD GPUs. It works on NVIDIA GPUs. What's really going on here? I know, I know, I know. It's the black box. The black box is really the problem. It must be Rockham. Surely it's Rockham. I scroll through I scroll through issues all day long, people complaining about Rockham not working. It must be Rockham. What would Jorge do? So I reach out to my good friend Jorge. I say, Jorge, what's going on here? Surely you've encountered problems like this before. You've seen these kinds of floating point bugs and Rockham's. Got any clue what I'm doing wrong here? Please tell me I'm doing something horribly wrong. So what we need to do is look at the main routine that forward steps our code. We set break points in the code at, at the various spots in our forward stepping algorithm. Looking at the boundary interpolation, how we do side exchange between the neighboring elements. We'll look at the uh, what happens when we set boundary conditions. Not worried about gradients because we don't have gradients enabled here. We'll look at our source method since we did just add that. It's going to be our, our Coriolis force here. Uh, we'll look at boundary flux and the flux method. Now inside of each of these, I know exactly which arrays are being modified. So we'll start interrogating in the debugger what's really going on underneath the hood and compare on the two pieces of hardware. At some point in this algorithm, those, those, those the outputs are going to be different between those two pieces of hardware. Now the interesting thing is what we immediately find is on the first two calls here between the boundary interpret and the side exchange, there's an attribute in the, in the solution object called ext boundary. It holds the information of what my neighbor's values are on a shared edge. These two things are completely different between AMD and NVIDIA GPUs. And I cannot fathom why this would be the case. In this back and forth with Jorge, we get to the point of like, well, what's really going on with your initialization? Are you actually initializing the values held on the GPU side for that EXT boundary buffer? Now, really, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, what really is going on here? This, this must still be the black box in some way. Why is it that I can run this code perfectly fine, get the right answer on one piece of hardware, move it to another, and get the wrong answer? So I go back to the initialization routine. So we insert this one statement down at the bottom of the initialization to, to copy that data that we initialize on the host to the device. So now at this point, everything should be initialized to zero. And wouldn't you know it, the answer's right. So what's the moral of the story here? Check your work. Make sure that error is actually reproducible and make sure what you've implemented is what you intended to implement. Be wary of the black box syndrome. While it's tempting to blame the dependencies that you actually rely on for your code, most often it's never the case that that's the problem. Now, to be fair, we do live in a world where we are working with open source software, so people make mistakes. It happens. And if you really are convinced that's the case, you should go to that repository and open an issue. But make sure that you have solid defense for why you think it's their problem. Be safe. Initialize your memory. Oh, well that's embarrassing.